and welcome to another edition of Turn Out a Punk. I'm your host, Damian Abraham, and once again, I'm bringing you a conversation with someone who grew up listening to punk, may or may not still be involved with punk, but had their life changed by the genre in a major way. And today on the show, a rare part two, but this might be one of those cases where the, the sequel tops the original. This is like a Godfather 2 of podcasts. Julian Baker is back on the show, and I think this is like the third longest episode ever. And it's it's got to be one of the top five best episodes. More on all this in one second. But first, if you want to get in touch with me, head over to the email address, turnedoutapunkpodcast at gmail.com. That is run by my brother and show producer and guest booker extraordinaire, Tristan Abraham. And he will get the message to me and we can communicate that way. I love you, Tristan. Thank you for all the hard work that you do on this show. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter and Instagram at left for Damien. If you want to support the show, the best way to support the show is just by telling everyone you know about it. You can also subscribe to it and rate it where you're listening to it. You can head over to patreon.com slash turned out a punk. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everyone that does do that. And uh, check out the stuff we do over there and support the show that way. And speaking of support, this show would not be possible without the kind, loving support of the fine folks at Vans who came aboard a few years ago and said, Damien, do this podcast, do it with all your heart. Just, don't pay for it out of your own pocket. And they've helped me cover the cost of this thing and it helps. <laughs> it really, really helps. And so I got to say a huge, huge thank you to them for believing in this thing. And uh, that's it. Uh, all right. If you're looking for stuff to do, check out over there at floodmagazine.com for punk as fuck punk AF. It's a series of videos that I did a couple years ago, walking around LA, meeting up with people talking about punk rock. There's, there's some cool people that have been on the show, some people that haven't been on the show, but I guarantee you, if you enjoy this podcast, you will love these videos over there. And also the band I play in, uh, Fucked Up, has a brand new, I, I don't know, <laughs> it's, a, it's a song, but it's like an hour and a half long, so it's uh, it's like a, an album long song. Anyway, three chapters are out, and there's a fourth one coming very soon. And there might be someone involved with today's episode, involved with that song. That's uh, I don't think we've announced that yet, so that's a little bit of a hint. But I think we talk about it in the episode, so you know, spoiler alert on that one. Uh, and yeah, so Fucked Up has those new songs. You can check them out over there at bandcamp.com, and uh, they will be available other places you know, down the line. But for now, that's what we're doing. I think that's it. I think that's it for plugs. All right, on to today's show. Today on the show, Julian Baker is back. And if you have not listened to Julian's part one, I, I, I don't want to say stop what you're doing right now because listen to this, but definitely go back and check that out because it is a it is an incredible conversation. And uh, yeah, I'm a huge fan of Julian's work and including her new record, Little Oblivions. But also having her on the show every time... As you will see by this episode, it's just one of those really profound, deep conversations that, you know, I, I walk away from and I wind up still thinking about it, you know, weeks later. I, I have to share it with you all right here. Uh, there's nothing more really to add. Go out and check out part one with Julian, by the way. Definitely check out Julian Baker's part one on Turned Out of Punk. But also check out her new record, Little Oblivion. She is an incredible lyricist, an incredible songwriter, and... Yeah, this record really reaffirms that. And I think that's it. No more notes for this at all or nothing. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Julian Baker on Turned Out a Punk. Julian, thank you so much for coming back to the show. Yeah, I'm very honored that you asked me on for a, uh, a follow-up <laughs> episode um because i enjoyed speaking to you so much uh previously well actually you know going back i always say your episode's one of the best episodes that i've ever gotten to do on the show but like going back and listening to your episode there are so many things that you bring up and you put things so like obviously you're an incredible lyricist so it should be no surprise but like at the same time you put things so succinctly and just like almost these perfect sound bites listening back that I'm just like, Oh, and I, 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 I do this podcast footnotes with Chris O'Toole and where we just mm -hmm. dissect the episodes afterwards. And after we did your episode, there's so many things that you brought up that we just were like, 
mulling over and discussing and these these sort of talking points so yeah i've been waiting for this to happen for a long time thank you oh of course it's my pleasure completely um well i guess i gotta start off with one of these sound bites that you threw out is this idea of green day doing and you this is how you put it which i think is so beautiful the concession of pop culture and this idea of an artist at a certain point you know, not just, you know, like, obviously you, you, you're doing it for commercial gains, but at the same time, there's also the idea that, you know, you have to concede something to, to make that leap. Yeah. I mean, and honestly, I've been thinking about that concept so much and how people think of commercial success and punk credibility as I don't know, antithetical to each other. And I don't know if I would still think, like, I respect Green Day as a band. I feel like I've been talking about Green Day so much, but they truly did, like, that's just the band that, hey, I know this is going to be edited, but my my manager just called me twice in a row. Oh, yeah, um, please take, do you want to take a break? And, can I? Yeah. Uh, yeah, can I just, sorry, because he yeah. doesn't ever do this, and I feel like yeah. something's... Yeah, Please. hold on. I'll be, I'll be right back. <laughs> sorry, bro. He, like, butt-dial repetitive called me, but you know when someone calls you, like... No, I get I'll it. Ignore no, please. A, Dude, I worry. will ignore a person's call once, but then if they call me twice, and especially, like, a third time, I'm like, something fucked up is happening. Yeah, like, absolutely. No, that's like an emergency basically, breakthrough. Yeah. Yeah, it's like a c crime these days to like call someone without texting first or having a, a, a like a previously agreed upon plan. But anyway, um, I get it. I, I get in trouble all the time for calling people. Like I got friends that make fun of me. I, like I got I got these friends that do for a wrestling cold podcast. calling. No, yeah, just call cold calling them and saying what's up. You know, I got these. They they do a wrestling podcast, and I've I've heard them make fun of me on the air for doing it. Like. Not even like like bringing me up as a weirdo who calls people. <laughs> That's so sad. No, I, I'm. I wonder if it's like I'd never know if it's me or if it's the other person like who has weird boundaries. But when I get a call from someone, I feel instant fear. I'm like, oh my god, I have to interact. I really don't want to interact with anyone right now. I'm becoming it, and quarantine hasn't done any favors for my uh, hermit behavior. So, I feel like it's brought us all though to my level. Like, welcome everyone to having to talk on the phone. Aren't you glad I kept you all in practice? <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, totally. I mean, and it was like, it's weird because throughout quarantine i know this isn't what we originally started talking about but throughout quarantine it's been actually like emotionally taxing to have to have every interaction with a person mediated through a screen and it has made me reevaluate like what parts of making music are even important to me or enjoyable or fulfilling um i don't know because y'all have been have y'all been writing like most of quarantine i tried no? I, I wrote a little bit i tried and only recently have i been able to kind of get back to being motivated to write but um yeah like when we started this thing i was supposed to be flying out to do lyrics for a new album that just kind of got mm -hmm. shelved and then we just started working on this project that we you know that obviously thankfully you are involved with as well but like that we started working on like five years ago and we're like oh well let's just do this other thing and i'm grateful that we did because i i, I wasn't able to write i don't know about yourself like how how hard that was but i found it impossible really i found that i mean i wrote a bunch like um I was working on a s score for a documentary like right at the beginning, like last summer. Um, and then after that, yeah, I mean, I, basically I just didn't know what to do without the mechanism of tour because that's been the 
force moving my life forward and kind of the sole focus of all the tasks I have to do in a day. And so without that to return to, I just play music in my house and make demos all day (laughs) and try to make myself better at like mixing and engineering um, just so I can be a little bit more competent in that realm. And it's been really fun. But yeah, I, I found it's a uh, it's been really fulfilling for me. And like I don't know, I <laughs> I guess it just depends on like how you feel most comfortable writing or like what's going on in your life. Because I'm sure it's like I don't know if I had children who were in school and I was trying to figure out what to do with my life now that the world was turned up upside down if I would have the mental bandwidth to write but the only thing I have to take care of is my dog so (laughs) I'm like I've got some some more flexibility in my obligations in my day well I think that's because you're you know sorry you're you're a you're a natural writer in a like I don't mean to put this on you. I don't know if you you are, but like from yeah. the outside, it looks like you're a natural writer. And I feel like I'm much more a performer. And that sort of loss of the performance side of things, I, I like I'm not a natural writer. It takes a lot to get there. And I feel like that's and it and especially with the kids, like it really called into question, like, well, what happens if I never am able to perform again? Like could, wow. you know, what I wish I had learned to play guitar. Aw, uh, no, I mean, that's, you're exactly right, and I, I think I've been really aware of the distinction between, uh, I mean, not to say that these, like, that a person can't be both a musician and a performer or oh, a musician. I, I'm sorry, and I, a, I, I realize, and now I realize, I didn't mean that in any sort of way. You are an incredible performer. In like... No, 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 no. That's not what I meant. I <laughs> yeah. meant that, like, I actually don't know, like, because this is the first time that I'm playing with a band again since Boy Genius. And then, like, before that, I hadn't played in a band in so lo- in many, many years. Which was always super weird for me because I, like, I hustled so hard and worked for years to try to promote my band and, like, buy a little, like, online billboard screen header for 30 seconds on some music blog and, like, toiled away trying to, whatever, make it. And then the record that I got recognition for was, um, oh my god. My roommates are screaming. I'm sorry. It's okay. Uh, you don't worry. But it's gonna uh, be my cat screaming in a minute. So <laughs> it's all it's it's the uh, the ambience, the foley of quarantine workspaces. <laughs> but yeah, and so then I like was performing alone just because that was the entry point that I finally had into being a musician as my career because I knew that I loved music more than anything else, and it was the thing I was passionate about, and then thing I wanted to give my life to but then I don't know it became and I don't think I realized this until I started playing with a band again with Lucy and Phoebe but it became really taxing the performance part when it was a one-sided conversation between myself and the audience and there was outside of Camille or Aisha playing violin with me there was no musical conversation going on. There was nobody else to play off of. Um, it felt, you know, <laughs> the setup felt very narcissistic, but also very lonely. Mm-hmm. And I'm realizing now that the part about, like, the thing that is enjoyable about performance to me is the cooperative nature of it. And I don't know, I've been reworking some of the old songs with the band because I just, I don't know if that's the kind of music that I want to play anymore because I really just want to make fun music with my friends. That's what makes performance tolerable to me because what I really 
I don't know. I find I'm fulfilled by writing songs, making them, putting them together, making something beautiful with my hands or with my voice. Um, and then, but it's like, unfortunately, touring is such a huge staple of how I make a living as a musician, you know? So, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And I think the one thing I really took from it is the idea of like, yeah, like m the performance, like, you could definitely do a performance now in front of a webcam. Like, you know, people have been doing a lot of that. I, I don't think, I think for me, it's definitely like you're saying that cooperative nature of live performance where that audience is also a, an equal part of the show. Like I, you know, obviously I'm, I'm a, uh, well, I don't know, obviously, sorry. I'm, I probably punished you with it last time. Uh, I'm a, I'm a wrestling fan and watching, I can't, I can't really watch pro wrestling right now because they have this, they don't have the audience there. So it's just so, it just totally changes the experience in the same way I find watching live streams of bands. It feels like I'm sitting in their practice space, watching some other bands practice. Yeah, no, totally. It was really hard. Like we did a lot, like a release show where we played a set that was mostly new songs. And when I watched it back, I was like, yeah, I get, that's, critical of my own performance and I feel like I, I could have been tighter but I always feel that way and but also I was like man am is that how I am like on stage all the time like I just felt like I'm already kind of maybe it sounds ironic to say shy on stage because my whole job is performing basically but I feel like you know banter and interacting with the audience and speaking in front of a crowd instead of just playing the songs they expect me to play is very difficult for me and I um and I think not playing shows for so long and having music be a private intimate pursuit and then playing to an empty room made me even more like reclusive and not low energy because it was Honestly, very, very gratifying to be able to just be in the same room as other musicians and playing music. Um, but yeah, I, it looked different and a little sterile to me. Um, I think we're not even at that point yet in Canada yeah. where we can even go back, or at least in Ontario, into the same room with each other. So I think that would even be different. It was more that kind of performance where everyone's in that complete like separate bubble separate world where oh, everyone's no. looking straight into the web camera trying to you know it just that that type of performance to me was something where yeah like i totally reassess like what is it that i do like um mm -hmm. and and it made me really appreciate go, being able to go and play for any size audience like i go back and if there's only like 12 people there buckle up 12 people because you will get the show of a lifetime Oh my gosh, that is exactly how. So, um, in uh, the touring lineup will be a little bit different than what we've been doing for all the like live pre-taped video stuff. But, um, Calvin, my very good friend who I've known since I was like fourteen, maybe, uh, who also produced this record and the last one with me, Calvin is playing bass, and Matthew Gilliam, who was in the star killers with me who I've also known for like a decade is playing drums and it's really neat because the thing we've bonded over is how like thrilled we will be to play for anyone in any venue <laughs> like we've just been so starved for it and I mean there's I can't think of a show that I have not taken seriously or been disappointed about because I don't know it's just not in my nature to be bummed that about a show that like anyone anywhere is playing um or th that anyone anywhere is coming to see and giving a damn about <laughs> but mm -hmm. I think I will cherish the shows extremely like I don't know I don't want to get emotional about it because that's been almost the top the topic of conversation for all the musicians in my life and like all the interviews I have done everybody is like 
I miss tour, I miss shows, I miss, and that's like all anybody can talk about constantly, even though we all know that we miss tour and we miss shows, but it's, I don't know, it feels like a community mourning its chance to get together, like, you know what I mean? It's so isolating, I really do, tr I truly think music is a communication tool and uh it's something that is experienced within a community and it's very weird to have music be isolated to a single viewer yeah i got and i got to the point where i i would say that i hated touring you know i would constantly say that in interviews i'd be like oh i i just i love being in a band i love playing the shows but i, I hate the act of touring and i don't know if it was like fear of like the intimacy of a show on some weird fucked up level type thing. But like, I, I don't, I think I was just so scared by how important this thing was to me that, you know, thinking that it would always go away on some level that only now that it's gone away, do I realize, Oh, the reason I hated touring is because I fucking loved it. And because I was living all my dreams and it was just too much for me to understand and appreciate. Wow. So I'm, I'm, I'm airing this shit out. Right no, now. it's fine. This is what we should. Okay. Because I think about that all the time. And honestly, we started talking about whether you necessarily have to forfeit or concede something to pop culture or just to the machinations of labels and booking agencies and press teams like if you necessarily have to do that in order to be successful but i guess then it's like well what is successful um if you want to be like commercially successful or be able to sustain yourself with the art that you make in a unfortunately like <laughs> super capitalist consumer society is that something that you have to do? And I, I don't know. I've been thinking about that a lot because I felt really bad. Like there was a part of me when I was touring alone that would text my friends from like my boys from Forrester and would feel like such a tra traitor. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, I feel like there is an expectation to do to like, especially in punk world. And this is something I am continuously reevaluating. But there is a an extreme loyalty to a specific set of like moral codes and expectations that I think even if they were fine and supportive with me doing the solo thing for a while I still couldn't ever reconcile it with myself and that's why it makes me so happy to be like playing like Matt is playing in the band and it's like you know Creech has a kid now Austin's doing other stuff um so the landscape has changed and now it's a matter of me trying to look at all the concessions I've made and the compromises or maybe the, the elements of myself I have changed and wondering if that ultimately benefited the people in my life more or if it was actually more advantageous for me to become a solo musician because now I occupy a very different space than I would have with a band and it's very important to me to be able to use that platform and like the modicum of power that I have in this world to try to affect real change and I don't know if I would have had that otherwise, but there is still, I don't know, this extreme 
intense loyalty that I feel towards my Memphis people, my boys. Well, I guess bringing it back to what you're saying, it's almost this concession to to pop culture that you mm-hmm. give, right? Like, and it's, it's um, you know, and it's not like it, it had to be this way. Like, it wouldn't have been able to happen otherwise. And even if it had happened otherwise, the way the music media is, they kind of force you to become the focal point as the front person of a band, you know? Especially like I, when you're a woman. Yeah, Especially when you imagine. are a, a woman that is fronting a band of straight white dudes Mm -hmm. i think then you're expected to like somebody i think about a lot is like this is gonna sound name droppy but she is just one of my good friends but um Haley from paramore became so like all of those musicians are extremely talented not least of all Haley as a songwriter, as a musician, but then what was, it seems like, I don't know whether this happened naturally or whatever, but it's like the performance of her as a front woman um, became like the whole ethos of that band for a while which i think i don't know and i'm seeing a lot of people do this like i think about brandy carlisle too like i just watched one of her live streams where she's like yeah i was in a band with the hanseroth twins and we were gonna put out a record as a band and a record as brandy carlisle and basically just talking about how she had been friends with these two dudes from the like diy seattle scene and then put out like a commercially viable record that did super well and how like the story is written by like maybe maybe objectively her most popular song but um is like written by one of the twins and i just like i don't know i'm looking to older musicians now for like an example of how they have how they've mitigated that tension i guess you know and i think like Haley and brandy are two really incredible examples of people who effusively praise the people around them and try intentionally with like their performance how they speak in interviews how they choose album artwork how everything you know it's like they are so intentional about bringing the focus of music back to a community in the context of a band even if it's like you know i don't know brandy carlisle performs under her own name and still is like this is a band um i and you know maybe i'm just getting super gushy about it because i haven't had the chance to be with either like with my full band lineup boys from memphis or with phoebe and lucy and b and have like band camaraderie i've been doing music alone (laughs) for Mm -hmm. a year and so um maybe that's why i'm waxing all philosophical about it now but no but i i i definitely you know feel that as well like how it just is you know, and, and obviously, you know, I, I experience it differently being a, you know, straight white dude, but like, I feel that they just pulled, like, there's a reason I'm doing a podcast. I certainly don't know the most about punk and fucked up, you know, and I'm probably not the <laughs> smartest person in fucked up, but there's a reason I'm doing the podcast as the front person. So, you know, I'm just, I'm just trying to say, like, I guess, you know, when it happens, it's all about how you use your platform and, and you need these artists, right? Like you need artists like yourself to to kind of make it and like there's one thing about i don't know daryl jennifer when he was on the show talked about the bad brains as Mm -hmm. in the ethos that was different between the bad brains and minor threat he's like ian wanted to be local he was okay with minor threat being a local band you know whereas to me bad brains were a revolution and i wanted to take that revolution all over the place and bring it to as many different people and like I think if you apply that to even the business sense that these two different bands had philosophically, 
it's it's just it's it's amazing how you know and obviously there's other reasons again like commercial success but like at the same time it's also like if you think of yourself as trying to get a message to as many people as possible you got to do whatever it takes to get that message across like look what chumbawamba chumbawamba sabotaged their career to get that 15 minutes of fame to try and talk about the message to people dude yeah well and i think about like system of a down writing about real like intense political stuff that is going on where they're from or like i, I mean rage against the machine is like zach de Lurka bringing crimes against the united states like war crimes <laughs> like mm. <laughs> accusing them of war crimes i mean accusing not as if we don't know that the u.s commits hella war crimes but um that's what i like those bands are massive and i know that there's no way that they got to be massive without making decisions that were beneficial for their career even if they were profit or commercial success oriented mm -hmm. and i wonder like that because that very that very um rhetoric has been deployed at me as a justification when i don't want to do something because <laughs> i feel like i'm i i am i can be stubborn it's a personality trait i try a lot to work out but i can be i'm sus of everything like <laughs> every opportunity for self-promotion that gets offered to me i'm like i don't know if that feels right but it's and it's i, I guess it has something to do also with taking up space because when i was in when i was in a local band in memphis that was like doing weekend warrior stuff to st louis and detroit and chicago and nashville you better believe i was fine with taking up space i was paying for my bands to have ads on to i this is gonna out me as like i don't know a scene kid or like emo revival kid but i paid for my band to have an ad on pup fresh the blog <laughs> well i actually watched well i watched a video of you 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 did like on social media trying to get a little bit of money to put out a split record for star oh my god an indie our indiegogo with, yeah um we were trying to put out a split with little moses yeah we were like actively out here creating like we were doing the very same things that i'm doing now we were trying to create content we were trying to engage with people over social media. We were trying to get people to share and buy our record and support it. And I think I felt much more, I felt much less grimy about that when I was, because it, when I was doing it with a band, because it felt like I was advocating for something larger than myself. But as soon, like, I don't know, it's, it's been a difficult thing for me. And honestly, I don't know, it, I just kind of try to take it as an ego death whenever I just bite the bullet and I see that, like, there's a bus ad with my face on it or something um, that I know is, like, paid for by, I don't know, the label or press or whoever. And I, it makes me cringe because it's just my name. And I feel really weird about it. But on some level, it's like, why didn't I have any qualms about this when I was scratching and clawing for anything for the Star Killers? You know? No, you you are uh, you're like you're speaking my inner monologue back to me, type thing. <laughs> like I I definitely get all this. I know, and I, I that's why I found it so hard to write. Like I was during this time. I was like, who, like we had this whole record planned out and I had all these lyrics written and then it's like, well, who am I to take up space now with this, you know, like, especially we live in an era where, you know, unlike when you're putting out those videos back then, like we live in an era where information is completely democratized, which means the, the song and the album that, you know, we work years on um, is worth the same amount as this podcast is worth the same amount as some random, like, 
Twitch video or t- sorry, that's how old I am. TikTok video is worth as much as like Twitch an, is still uh, a thing. I'm Twitch not on TikTok, right. so we're old. Yeah, but go ahead. Yeah, it's, <laughs> no, but, yeah. you're right. Oh no, I was gonna and as a major news story too, which is like important information too. So it's just like unless it makes it now like I feel like if you, if I'm not gonna say something important, I I don't want to say it. That is exactly how I feel. Um, I mean, that's why I feel like interviews have gotten harder for me the longer that I've been an artist because I keep getting asked questions and I am so hyper aware of the fact that like man do I go here I'm gonna do it okay so like I I don't want to (laughs) make other people uncomfortable but I feel most at ease when I am trying to be as transparent as I can because then I feel like I have less to hide but like a thing that goes through my brain all the time and I because I talk about this with my friends who are musicians who are like cis straight white dudes I'm like man I understand that it benefits the publications that I speak to and the people that praise my music because I give I can afford them some legitimacy as an artist who is openly queer and who is a woman and like uh is a part of like I have these parts of my identity that make me marginalized in whatever way and it is to whatever extent, like, now it is more fashionable and honestly lucrative for those people to praise queer artists. And so I have this whole monologue of, like, and on top of that, it's like, man, I have people that work for my label and me that have relationships, and I'm not, this isn't diminishing the value of their work or the authenticity of it but it's something i can never get out of my brain that i'm constantly aware of it's like there are people that work for my press and i am afforded this platform on some level because i can afford it financially because i was in a position for whatever reason, like, I don't know how much it has to do with my actual talent. And so I've tried to stop, and this this is a great way to meander back into a conversation about punk music, because I think understanding that and kind of zooming out from how contrived music now is, I can recognize that my music doesn't have to be a work of genius or an amazing revelation or a tour de force to be worth something. That's kind of the whole thing that's attractive about punk music is that it's easy to play because it's ugly. I mean, it's not like it's ugly mm-hmm. in a good way, and I'm sure you know what I mean. But I totally, yeah, absolutely. If you if you drop tune your guitar and slide your finger around some bar chords. You can write a song and express yourself and you don't have to be formally good and you don't have to be highbrow, artistically gifted. You just have to have the desire to put your feelings into a microphone and into the world at a show or on a little cassette tape or anything. And it's like, Yeah, now that I understand that that is the value of music and that I don't have to be, I don't have to be compliant with this super competitive comp, I was going to say a competitive competition, but I mean like this world where it feels like people are competing for recognition or seeking validation Like, when I understand that I am just a drop in the bucket of 
or, or like a drop in the ocean of a culture whose tides are constantly shifting, I can take my own art less seriously in a way that makes it more fulfilling to me and in my opinion kind of returns me to interacting with music the way I did when I was a child and I think I don't know that's important to me no I, de I definitely get that it's amazing how you know like it's it's I think we we need that ego to survive it too because you need that ego to protect you like that that is also mm -hmm. like a def self defense you have to build up to protect you from you know and and like once again this vitriol varies very much depending on who is the artist in question but the vitriol that you get from people that are insecure by your success and i mean that like on every level like just people that want to give you bad reviews for whatever reason or people that want to lob um just like oh they're a sellout or type thing like these sorts of type things at you is because but that's why you need this sort of defensive ego that also makes you overvalue your own work sometimes and not be, like and i'm saying this what i mean when i say you i mean me no 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 i get it it's the the like the like one. us yeah yeah <laughs> us um yeah i mean and it's like i don't i don't know what else to do there's part of me that is constantly thinking about projects that could make it less of a single person focus <laughs> like my music like i don't know like what if i started making records for other bands or i just had a whole bunch of people do a collaborative record all together and when i think i remember having this conversation about the freedom of success allowing artists to be eccentric um and that's not always the case. I mean, there are certainly artists who are weird and oppositional and countercultural and radical without success. But I do think there's a lot of artists where I can observe their trajectory from making music that kind of did okay, conceding to whatever the mechanism of the music industry gaining stability as an artist or power or wealth and using that to do something really weird you know like mm. i feel that the freedom that comes with being commercially successful best case scenario will make an artist feel and i don't know if it's if it's out of complete freedom or like just responsibility to do something weird and because you know that you're being observed like that i don't know that's kind of how i feel now is like i want to now that i have made all of these compromises use the power it's afforded me to do something that is inevitably going to be hyper visible to influence music in a good way like i, I don't yeah. know that sounds like such a miss america answer but i'm like <laughs> that's the only way i can think of mitigating the punk guilt with, I, <laughs> you know well it's so funny to hear you talk about you know or not talk about but to hear you describing yourself as an artist who's made compromises because i would describe you as a very uncompromising artist like one of the most uncompromising artists when i hear your music so it's interesting to, to hear but i think that's all of us have to do that like you know at the end of the day you know there's like last time you brought up like why was like we were talking about why wasn't it 15 why was it green day it's because green day was willing to make the the compromises and the sacrifices to to, to you know and i'm sure uh, honestly I, i'm sure billy joe deals with his guilt like i don't i've never met him but i would love yeah. to talk to him about it because i'm sure he does on some weird level even in spite of all the millions kind of goes geez i bet tim yohannan's still super fucking bummed even though he's dead yeah <laughs> yeah dude i mean and it's so 
it's so difficult for me too because there is a, a certain level of chaos to it as well. Like, imagine if... I don't know. I, I was at a show. Somebody suggested my music to Sean, who at that time ran 6131. I got signed to that label. I got some more resources. I kept making music. You know what I mean? But what? I don't know. I could have been at some other show. And somebody else could have been playing that show. Or I could have been friends with someone different that wasn't friends with Sean. Or I could have not gone on X or Y tour. Or I could have gone to Cincinnati instead of Columbus, Ohio. I don't know. There's just like so many things where I feel like I'm able to continue to challenge myself as a musician because I was given resources and I always wonder like what would happen to the artists that are brilliant and undiscovered that I listen to if they were just given resources. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't want to... <laughs> I'm not going to, like, force you the whole time to talk about, like, the <laughs> um, redistribution of resources in the music industry by punk no, people. No, this is the but... best. This is the best. Every time you come on the show, it's, like, the best conversation, Julian. Like, this is incredible. Like, I've got a list of questions I want to get to. Because, like, anytime I do a part two, I get so anxious about doing these part twos because... Really? I'm so... Well, I, 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 I kind of, like hide behind this format you know because i can just kind of like ask people kind of like all these nerdy questions i have but there it's almost like there's a structure to it you know but when someone comes on for a sure. part two it's like that's when it's like what are we going to talk about but like so i have a whole list of things oh, sure. i wanted to talk to you but i haven't even had to scratch any of these off the list like some of them come <laughs> up naturally but the rest of them i'm like this is just an amazing conversation no but i think what you're saying about this this idea of of I don't know, like, why is it us? Like, why why was it this band? And, uh, you know, my band didn't, hasn't achieved the success you've achieved. But, like, I think, you know, we've all, there are plenty of artists that have these resources, that have these opportunities. So many people that have come on this podcast, and there's just something about what they were doing that, and maybe it's just a timing thing. It, it might have nothing to do with them as songwriters, but it just doesn't connect. And it doesn't hit that emotional core. Yeah. And that's the thing that I think separates, like, that's why it's, bands that find success is because they they can hit a chord and like you know like i used to like agonize over the fact like why the offspring you know why them <laughs> and it's like oh because they well they hit the chord at the right time and like they were of course you know much more in the zeitgeist than than neurosis was you know for what was going to hit yeah. with people in a big way you know so i don't i like i had a radio i had a video t tv show for a second and I honestly thought the day I played the Chrome Eggs on TV that it was going to cause like this musical revolution and like <laughs> no one was going to listen to Ju like I, honestly, I was like I was delusional like I was smoking a lot of weed and I just got into <laughs> weed so that might have something to do with it but I was out to lunch because I honestly thought that was the case and not realizing like oh no there's something so much deeper about why artists become the artists they become in, in other people's minds and it's because they've got this emotional connection with an audience. Absolutely. I mean, that's what <sighs> I've been revisiting a lot of the music that I listened to when I was a kid, and it's really clear to put it into the categories of like, this is stuff I liked because this was speaking to my experience at the exact right time and perfectly articulating feelings and thoughts that I had, but I wouldn't I was just about to get into I don't, I don't ever like to organize music hierarchically I guess like I don't want to be like this is bad music this is good music but there's definitely music that I wouldn't suggest to people now <laughs> like yeah. oh this is one of the best songs I've ever heard even if it was like a very a song that was extremely significant to me at the time but it's yeah I don't know it's very it, it's difficult <laughs> to think about one of the most like uh profound things that you brought up last time and we got to last time was this idea of like punk as a faith and this idea that it fulfills that role in people's lives where it can become almost like um like it, it almost becomes like uh 
you know, like a, a doctrine to people and like, it does become a faith, you know, and the idea that you will, you, you, you're, you're, you will shun people based on their level of faith. You're like, sure. how deep do they go? Sure. Yeah. I mean, well, it, that's, Ooh, I knew that I brought that up and it's funny because I've had, I, like shortly after we did that podcast, I radically changed the way that I think about faith and I think mm. it's not that I got more skeptical but it's just that I I wanted to try to be more discerning about the investment I put in a faith tradition and how that's different from the pursuit of knowing God whatever that means or like being a good person and I can see that paralleled in punk as well. Like, I went through a phase where I thought, very early in my life, where I thought that to affirm yourself as a punk kid, you listened to punk music and you went to punk shows and you said punk things. Right? But now I'm kind mm -hmm. of, like... I feel myself, and I don't know if you feel this way either, but I feel myself, especially it's been exaggerated from quarantine because I don't get to, like, go to the DIY spots here and see who's opening for the one band I know and find all these little ways to branch off into, like, what the youths are listening to. But I feel more and more... I'm I'm 25, and that's not, like, super old at all but i do feel no I not at all i promise <laughs> i feel distance <laughs> you're the youngest person on the show in a long time <laughs> i know that's why I'm, I'm trying to be careful not to put my foot in my mouth because i i feel oh I, no you're like one of the most one of the <laughs> smartest people that's been on the show no, in a long I, time too so I, i'm aware of punk history or like the history of hardcore and i've had people in my life share like older bands and explain why they were significant and like walk me through <laughs> things I had no idea about but now I I feel myself becoming alienated from whatever the DIY scene looks like right now which I'm sure there's not much of it because I, I guess I would be correct in assuming that the progressive ideology holding punk kids are going to be the ones who really don't want to have a show with a bunch of people um and aren't trying to b bend yeah, the rules so. yeah it's <laughs> it's uh um you would hope so but and i don't know i'm trying to relinquish my ownership of that world or like my fully identifying with it and understand that there's that punk is a lot more it's a, a much more mutable concept than I thought I before than I than I would have said before like I I think that there's not even necessarily so many last time we talked about hip hop and punk music and I've been thinking about that so much just watching like I mean my friends from Memphis get into like Little Peep and like SoundCloud rappers and hearing the things mm -hmm. that those rappers are speaking about and the topics they're addressing and the lives they're leading and being like this is just Blink-182 energy with drum machines you know what I mean? It's very much like chaotic, uh, authority averse, um, mayhem, and like a fuck the world attitude, but also like these little disclosures of of deep sadness and deep pain, and it's being told through a it, told in a dialect i guess or like a musical style that i am so 
outside of <laughs> that I'm like very um, that's very foreign to me. And yet I think it's accomplishing many of the same things that the music I listened to when I was a kid, the like pop punk or punk rock music I listened to did for me. So I don't know. I Where are you with that? I feel, I don't want to be like I'm feeling myself getting old, but I am feeling myself much more be like, oh, I don't I don't know, like the house show band that's popping off now. And I used to only know those bands. And yeah, it, it, it feels like that happens to I think everyone at a certain point where you do have to kind of like and this is obviously very different right now because of the situation we're in, but like where you do have to kind of give it up to the next wave. And that's what keeps punk alive. Like I think in the, in the way that there's always going to be, and there's definitely lifers that, you know, but I think every band eventually you age out of it because you're gone a lot. You're touring more and more. And I think that's, you know, why there is that renewal, but I think you're right. Like it definitely, there is a cultural shift. I'm though like, surprise like constantly surprised about how much still trickles back like playboy cardi put out that record this year and it's got the slap ripoff cover oh my gosh um, yeah and like there's like the these kind of like weird connections to it like you said last time like that's the best thing about punk rock is kind of the idea that the lessons learned yeah. are going to be passed down and that's what's going to sure. be shared well i mean it's like trippy red put out that record where it's like half trap music and then it's called this is also a very like house show band t album title it's called pegasus neon shark versus pegasus <laughs> and then there's like i'm like bro that's the most like like, there was a house show band that had a song called Manifest Destiny Ate My Homework in Memphis. Yeah. And I'm just like, yeah, that that's exactly that ethos. And half of that record is, like, weird, polished, not weird, but, like, super polished pop punk guitar riffage. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I don't know, I, now that is, <laughs> I don't know, I was alive at a time where that was almost exclusively what I listened to. And it was very of the moment. And now that it is an homage to something or it's like derivative or it's a flex or or just a window into that artist music taste, it makes me feel for the first time like I'm actually able to observe the waves. And, you know, I was thinking about this yesterday. I was like on a run listening to I'm gonna theoretically produce uh, a friend of mine's band's record which I've never done before awesome. so I hope it um I hope it goes well I'm really non-confrontational so I'm probably gonna be the worst producer ever I'm just gonna be like Pro whatever you think I just it's up to you <laughs> which is like not a producer's <laughs> job but um I was listening to like the reference mix playlist and I there were songs on there that were artists from the 70s that I had never been aware of. There were songs on there that are artists from this year and last year that I had never been aware of. And it, it was this relieving kind of... It, it was very perspective green. And I, I, I say it was a relieving experience because... I instantly, like, when I, I would hear, like, two or three songs on there, and I'd be like, oh, if you like this song, I bet you'll like, I don't know, Why Oak. Or if you like this song, I bet you'll like Land of Talk and bands that are maybe a little bit more my era. Um, mm -hmm. But then also it's like, I, I don't know, I was just listening through this playlist wondering about what each song meant to the people in the band and, like, who picked what and who brought like, I wonder who suggested P PJ Harvey to these people because nobody ever suggested PJ Harvey to me until I was in college and I'm sure that like with them there's other stuff that may maybe they would like that has slipped through the cracks that I might be able to share with them and then even if it's not me making the music it's like I 
have been invited into this dialogue with a band about the things that influence them and the things they want to do and and the bands they admire and it's i don't know it's kind of like being a conduit for a current along a little circuit you know i'm i'm trying to let go of myself as needing to have the best taste or know about the real hardcore bands or to know about all the old school lingo and I'm trying to look at myself as a person who's just one more diode <laughs> in the <laughs> in the like schematic that has that like when music is transmitted through my human lens it takes on a slightly different character and it then informs the taste and the creative output of the people that I share that with even in a conversation and that to me is like I don't know I just love talking about music <laughs> that's like yeah. and I I do I do this all the time like with you you said it was like calling cold calling people but what I do my weird thing is I don't know how to interact with a person and make like small talk about bullshit so with all of my friends it's basically just like me sending them unsolicited spotify links because music <laughs> is such a safe space like when we can just be like yo isn't this song a bop yeah let's talk about like oh cool drum sounds or wow like that's a weird production element like i feel so comfortable and so at peace in those types of conversations because they're the least loaded but also somehow the most significant to me yeah i think because punk was like the last one of the last places where information was a commodity you know mm -hmm. and you could like hold that over people and you know nothing has been more sobering for what is music taste than having kids where you know, they don't care about any of these rare records I got surrounding me. They don't give a, they like, they're like, Oh, that sounds all right. Like whatever. Cause it's like the, you just, you don't need to appreciate music and hold on to music in the same way. And it's going to be less and less like that. You know, like, I think obviously you'll still love music and you still need music in your life, but you don't need to understand the connective tissue in the same way that you and I do, you know, like you don't, you know, I don't think people are going to be researching it in the way that we do now oh really so you think like with street i think i mean i agree with you to some extent that when we're not and this could change but when we are interacting so much with our music and the the connective tissue like you say is um largely based on you know whatever x or y streaming services algorithm decides should come up in related artists or frequently searched for together instead of I don't know reading articles about your favorite artist in like whatever revolver magazine or like whatever it is like it when we're physically observing those bands as they come through your town and you see them change and you see who they're touring with which still happens but yeah, I agree. I think maybe it has to do with the fragmentation of genre, and I, I don't know, I think that's quickly going to become a really obsolete way to characterize music, but yeah. It, and you know what? That kind of makes me sad, though. It makes me sad because when I read articles about what my favorite bands were listening to and then listen to those bands i guess there's still like playlisting and stuff but i i think it's just like so much higher of a volume of information to try to consume when anything is at your fingertips basically for like ten dollars a month you know yeah it's yeah I, yeah sorry i didn't mean to cut you off sorry no i was done I, it's uh have you heard that nirvana song written by an algorithm that came out it's terrible i wish we had cameras on so you could see my like shoulders just go slack with disappointment that makes <laughs> yeah. me so sad dude 
come on. No, I haven't, but I'm going to have to f- look it up after this conversation. It, it, it's done for a good cause. Like it's done for some mental health uh, charity initiatives type thing, but it's also, it is, it is not good. I heard someone, I saw what I heard. I saw someone dunking it online, uh, calling it like a puddle of mud. You know, the name of the computer was Puddle of Mud, which I thought was very. Oh apropos, my God. That's... <laughs> I do know the band Puddle of Mud. They got kind of yeah. dunked on for doing. Did they do a cover of Rape Me? It was for some. It was like, I again, I really don't like um, to shit on bands because I think it's mean and they're all out here trying. But yeah, I, I know. Yeah. I know about Puddle of Mud. <laughs> that's his <Exactly>. one. <laughs> I can but see it's, Puddle it's, of Mud at Memphis in May because Memphis in May loves to book some uh, butt rock artists. And it's like yeah. I would see them and Saving Able. I saw Hinder, fam. At, I saw Daughtry open for Hinder. Oh, what <laughs> at, a lineup. Oh, my God. Yeah, what a lineup indeed. I mean, but <laughs> honestly, at that time, again... I'll say this, and it relates a little bit to what we're talking about, like the ambiguity of punk. When I went and saw Daughtry and Hinder with my dad, I was stoked, and my dad was stoked, because I was like Mm -hmm. 13 years old. I was hungry for anything that sounded like rock music or anything that was punk adjacent, and this was the music that was playing on the radio and was playing on the TV, and I didn't have a ton of resources outside of the t-shirt wall at Hot Topic and my friends to learn about new music. (laughs) So, I mean, of course, I was just thirsty for anything. And then for my dad, it's like, he didn't have any more. It's like, this sounds like the closest analog to the music he would have liked and connected with as a child when he was like, listening to white snake and billy squire and Mm -hmm. that i like uh i I, whatever about those bands like personalities i know nothing about them but just like to see that they were able to take up a space in the culture that made both me as a 13 year old and my dad as a 40 year old regular guy just happy i was like yeah you deserve to get to take up space. So I'm like, I don't beef with butt rock as as much as I used to. I think I used to be pretty pretentious about it, but yeah. And as much as I would never listen to Puddle of Mud or any of those bands, like they have made a lot more people's lives a lot happier than my band ever has. You know, yeah. like in the, at the end of the day. Yeah, totally. Uh-uh. <laughs> um, but anyway, back to sort of the the reason I bring that up is just that I don't think the algorithms are good enough yet. Like I would never through playlist and algorithm suggestions on a streaming service, find out that about your love of Pez or, or that you sure. like Madball, you yeah. know, like that wouldn't, it's just not advanced enough. And at some point, maybe it will be like, I don't doubt that there will be eventually an algorithm that will write the best Nirvana song ever. And there'll be an algorithm that one day will suggest like the second Pez seven inch when I'm listening, you know, to hardline on, sure. on the streaming services. But like it, until that day, it's it, i think that's why i'm kind of bummed about the shift you know that's the only reason i'm bummed about it i don't know see i think i disagree with you i don't know and this is of course me as a human being holding on to the illusion of my own uniqueness and specialness but i doubt an algorithm being sophisticated enough to connect all of those dots and i think what is more likely to happen we're just like weather people of the future so i don't know if this is true (laughs) this is just like what i would expect to happen i think people will swing back in the other direction of the pendulum like i think when you there's already so much and it's not even just about streaming music it's about everything. Like, I mean, there was a documentary called The Social Dilemma on Netflix, a streaming service, about how <laughs> streaming and social media and constantly being online is mentally and emotionally destructive. And people have that awareness, and I think 
there as much as we can benefit from it i think there are limits to it that will force people to always want to engage with music or with art or with just other human beings um on a more genuine level that said though what creeps me out about the algorithm is sometimes it's dead on i'm like yeah this this is the kind of stuff that i want to listen to like i do actually like this band um that i've never heard of before but then it almost becomes i was having this conversation with someone earlier like instead of there being a radio dj who plays you a song and then talks about why he she select uh, they selected that song you just have a sort of talking head faceless information dispersal where it's like here's a playlist that has been categorized by mood or genre or it's like early 2000s pop punk or 80s hair metal and then you don't have any other you don't have any further context for why those songs were selected or any anecdotes about the musicians or the players and there's also like an artificiality of taste like the cool thing about a radio show is that a radio show or just like your friend suggesting you music is that their taste is different from yours but i find that the more sophisticated that these algorithms and more specific the playlists become it's not actually stuff that challenges you or <laughs> i don't know if that makes mm -hmm. sense you know it's mm -hmm. just like a playlist full of things that obviously i'm gonna like but that i don't have any further investment in because they've just all been compiled into songs like a group of songs that are sonically similar um yeah no you don't force yourself to like stuff anymore you like you don't have the commitment to physical format that like where you'd be like oh well i bought this i don't really like it but i'm gonna listen to it till i kind of like it because it costs x amount of dollars straight up and i feel like such a like kids these days but um yeah you don't have to force yourself to like stuff anymore and i think like for me even buying seven inch singles and like album albums lps wasn't the only way for me to get music as a child certainly and i mean it was for my mom and she would be like you know i didn't have an ipod i didn't have hundreds of songs when i was your your age but it's really easy to see now that it's been a decade even though i had like an ipod that could hold thousands of songs i, I every song individually costed a dollar yeah. and i would like pine for and beg for itunes gift cards and then i would just like buy a handful of songs from bands that i wanted to check out and if i didn't immediately like the song it was like okay well you're sol because <laughs> that was the five dollars you had and if you were like me who wanted to be listening to music all the time i would just keep listening to songs even if i didn't like them and not make myself like them but like spend enough time with the music that i could see its merit or maybe something that didn't initially click with me started to click because i had a limited amount of songs to invest my time in and now i have an no limit at all really yeah and i find it also because of the no limit thing it makes me less adventurous you know it's like the same problem that people always bring up with streaming services where like they're like oh i'll just watch friends again or or like i'll just watch this thing i've watched a trillion times i find that with music like i go back and i listen to the same song over and over again just because like it's it's almost like oh geez there's just so much choice might as well just go to the thing i know seriously yeah and it's like i don't know it's harder for me to yeah i guess it's just the same thing it, it's harder for me to 
find new music that I am genuinely super excited about. I feel like it's not that I've become jaded or calloused in any way, but that just happens less. And at first I thought that it was because I, like, whatever, I'm getting older and my, like, threshold for being moved by music is higher. I don't think that's it, though. It's, like, I... I just statistically encounter so much more music than I would have a, been able to ever a decade yeah. ago. Yeah. And so yeah. I find myself, but then also I don't want to like, I feel super bad when I just like skip through songs because it's like, I don't know, that artist made a whole record and put this single up and supported it. And then I, clicked on it because it was suggested to me and I didn't really, wasn't really all about it, so I just passed it. And then I always have this uh, like FOMO. Like what if I am missing out on this artist that I would love but I just haven't found them because panning for gold in the riverbed of all the grains of Spotify artists is really time consuming, I guess? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Have you ever watched that John Peel documentary that they made just before he passed away? No. He, he has this one part in it where they're talking to him and he's just in this room full of records. Like it's, it's unlike any personal collection I've ever seen. And he's just frantically listening to all these records. But like you're saying, he's almost like picking up the needle and just quickly going through it as much as possible. Like, and just being and they're like, and he's, he's just talking about how, his big fear is when he dies, not hearing that song that would change his life. You know, like there's stuff out there that he's not going to ever hear. And I remember just how mortal I felt hearing that, you know, on tour, just being like, holy shit. Yeah. Like I, this isn't my music as much as I pretend like it is. And I'm going to hold on to it forever. Like this is all going to keep going when I'm gone. And, and it's, it's uh, there's something very humbling and, and sort of sad and scary about that all at the same time for sure no and I, I think as much as I used to kind of advocate for s streaming services and Spotify and Bandcamp it, Bandcamp's a little different but it, just for the sake of this argument like it does kind of bring the the rungs lower or maybe it like puts more rungs on the ladder so that it's there's mm -hmm. less hurdles to getting your music into a a space where it can be heard it's not like you have to get on a major label and wait for them to distribute your record to a record shop and hope that the guy suggests it to his customers you can just put it on the internet and in some ways i think that's great but it does come with that very sad like well you know what I don't know if it's sad because kind of the same thing that I was talking about with understanding how temporary my time as a musician of with any recognition is makes it so much easier to value music as an ongoing community pursuit that may be however big or small my band is or the music that I make is it will influence the way somebody else writes songs it'll be a like a penny in the jar of their full ethos like I don't know there's so many bands that influenced me that just never played outside of memphis or nashville and it's and it's like but then they became cornerstones of my musical taste and how i mean cornerstones of my musical identity and how how i engage with songwriting so it's like i don't know i don't want to get all emotional about it but that's the contribution that i find solace in well, and and you you have you know not become Green Day in any sort of way because obviously you've done it, something completely different, but you've done that same sort of thing because after you were on the show for the first time, there's so many people that reached out to the show 
talking about how important of an artist you are to them and, and getting them into this kind of stuff. And just, you know, by you being on this podcast, how many people checked out other people that were on this show from punk rock, That's you know, awesome. like, it, but it's like, it's, it's, you know, and I, and I think about, you know, your bandmate when, when she's on Saturday night live and, you know, and like how important when you're on big talk shows, like how all this stuff is like, how, how big these things are and these moments are for getting, for, for actually changing people's lives. Totally. And I think, I mean, Phoebe is a great example because she's obviously succeeding (laughs) is an understatement uh, in her individual music career. But it's also like she has a label. She uses her power to reallocate resources to people that are making good music. (laughs) <laughs> that are like mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. maybe younger than herself and I think you know it's like Lucy does the same thing it's like being very intent upon like treating I don't know bands that she admires well and like I they're great models of human beings to be around but yeah I don't know I think that you get to a point where you recognize the limit even if I we're like selling out arenas there's a limit there's a limit to how much staying power that has and it almost becomes arbitrary after a while and like hmm, i don't know it just makes me think about like why you or i even started playing music in the first place and that's a very like back to basics type of thing Mm -hmm. but i think if you don't do that if you don't remind yourself to have a little self-imposed ego death and reevaluate your motivations for playing music, I think you will absolutely get jaded and unhappy. It's like yeah. it will happen to you. I, I I think it's it's you know like you're saying like very, like the very start of this long conversation. By the way, this is an incredible conversation anytime anytime you want to come back on this show please know it'd be an honor to have oh thank you (laughs) Uh, you. but back at the very beginning of the whole thing when we were talking about the concession to pop culture where you lose control at every stage like we talked about rage against the machine like rage against the machine like zach would have had so much more control over his career in inside out you know, and like, you know, when Phoebe, mm-hmm. Phoebe's on Saturday Night Live and all of a sudden she's getting shit from David Crosby, like a guy who, of course, is never going to get it, you know, like, like he, he's not going to get it. And all of a sudden you're like, you you don't have the control over the audience that you do when you're playing to basement shows or, or, or like community space shows. Well, and I think it's because the more, first of all, that David Crosby comment made me so fucking mad. I was like, bro, are you serious? Person literally, like, I don't know. I, that whole situation made me really upset. I was just like, I, I don't I don't understand why everyone is mad. Like, it, yeah, it took me, it so like, insane. several days to get to the bottom of, like, the tweet that started it. I was like, because when I saw the performance, like, of course, we, like, uh, all like wanted to see it and stay up and watch it and i was like my first thought was that's the most bad at like that's punk that's super punk like what so what if it was planned there are artists who take like 50 guitars on the road and smash a guitar every night it's gimmicked it's planned yeah point is the optics of it and the point is like asserting herself as a female musician taking up space and doing rock and roll shit (laughs) on national television on saturday night live for christ's sakes and to me it's like that that's the most rock and roll thing i don't see any how anybody could have a problem with that but anyway and that Go ahead. That platform too, Saturday Night Live. There's so many people that come on the show that talk about that B52's performance, or I'll talk about that Rancid performance, or like the Racing Against Machine performance. Like that thing, 
you know, and Phoebe's performance will be this too. Like that thing will kick off the next wave. And like, yeah, like people talking about it's contrived. Like it wasn't fucking contrived when Nirvana did it every show for Bru- like an entire career. Yeah, totally. And I mean, that's, gosh, I think signaling is not always bad. Like virtue signaling, but also like having a specific message that you're trying to get across with specific imagery and honestly not to just keep talking about how fucking brilliant phoebe is but um i try not to be like up her ass all the time because she's my friend but i'm like damn she is a person with an extremely focused vision and like all of the signals that she sends with imagery and how she carries herself and like down to the clothes that she wears and the way that she behaves on stage and the things that she says are like I don't know when Nirvana is smashing a guitar every night on stage is it contrived or is it half planning to have a time where you showcase very real passion and rage. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. when I think mm-hmm. about... And I think about how that line sometimes is so thin. Like, I remember going to... Maybe I talked about this on the last uh, episode, so I don't want to repeat myself, but when you talk about how you have... I don't know, not less control of the audience, because... I don't know, I'm sure everybody at like a taylor swift stadium show is like in the palm of her hand because they all (laughs) spent like hundreds of dollars to go see taylor swift but i think you it's not that you have less control maybe it's less commonality maybe yeah what what i I was looking for the right word and i'm not disagreeing with you but it it, it has to do with like so I remember we were on like our first little baby tour. My dad was with us um, and we played at this dive bar in like Columbia, South Carolina. Um, and we stayed an extra day because the day the next show got canceled, which like half the shows got canceled. <laughs> um, and we saw this band Defeater. And I loved that band. It was like Defeater, Touche, Law Dispute. When I was growing up, those were like the kind of um, the all stars of the like post hardcore scene. And I remember seeing that band play. And I don't know if it's even true if he cried, but I remember somebody being like next to me after their set was done, being like, he cried. That was so awesome. And it was the first time, because we were just, like, exhausted. We had played a show at the same venue, but to, like, three people, not, you know. It was like a, it, they filled out the, the whatever, the, the 400 cap. Um, so we had played at the same venue, and I was just like, man, I don't know how I would feel if somebody said that it was awesome that I cried. Because it's actually emotionally taxing and, and very physically demanding to go to that place during a live set. And so, like, when I think about the fact that when artists grow and become more widely recognized, the tours get bigger, the crews get bigger, the set gets more dialed in, maybe it gets a little bit more flexible, maybe things are less fluid you know what I mean? Like yeah. n- now when I perform, there's a lot about the performance that's very calculated and there's transitions that we work out before. And it's because, I mean, for me, A, it's higher stakes, but B, there is a point where the larger the body of people witnessing you, I think the easier it is to do this hive mind detachment from the performer as a person and like when you're watching your hometown screamo band play a floor show and your buddy is like walking straight up to everybody and screaming in their face you feel that and when you see somebody 
performing for hundreds of thousands of people, it becomes much more difficult maybe to expect the same kind of emotional transparency because imagine what that would take for the artist. Yeah. Um, yeah, but so at that point, it's like once you get to the point where you're playing beyond the, the intimacy of house shows and floor shows at a basement, or, it becomes, and again, this is, I'm speaking from my personal point of view, the, th- the the things about my life and about the live show and about my musical career that have become more calculated are because there's so much more at stake. I don't want to flip... If I flippantly said something kind of like rude or sarcastic into the microphone in front of 15 people in my hometown, then, yeah, they would just be like, Julian was pissed off. I don't know what was up with her tonight. But if I behaved that way or I was like much more cavalier with the messaging that I'm sending to people listening to my music now, I don't know. It just makes, it leaves a larger wake. Even though I'm aware that like a wake, it will eventually disappear, it still matters. And so I just feel the need to be more meticulous. You know, like, and I don't know, but I don't, I guess my point in explaining those two thought processes is I don't think something being calculated necessarily has to mean it is disingenuous does that make sense yeah 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 no i totally get that i totally get that and i think i think i think about kurt cobain a lot you know it's just like a almost like you know like why would you want that success and obviously not to under but the the horrors of the battle that he had with addiction or mental health and and also stomach conditions and all these sorts of more serious things sure. but also he seems like someone that did really grapple with the idea of like, what is this success? And like, he, he seems like someone, you know, from talking to people that knew him too, that would have been much happier to just ultimately have been in a band kind of the size of like a Husker do, you know, or, yeah, or like, you know, something a little more tangible because at, at the end of the day, like you're saying, like, if, if you're in a band and at a certain level and you fuck up and you, you tank your career you're not just tanking your career, you're tanking so many people's lives around you. There's so many people that are dependent on some just you going out and making music after a certain point that I can only imagine how much pressure that was for him to yeah. try and stop doing that. No, oh my God, I can't imagine. But then also, like, when he died, the way that people reacted was to deify him. And I'm, mm-hmm. I don't want to be speaking out of turn here, but that seems to be the exact behavior that gave him so much internal conflict is to be yeah, deified yeah. in that way. And so I think it's like, sure, I, I have to think about not only my life, but the life, the livelihoods of my, my band and my team and my manager, and my crew. I also have to think about the th- things that I have less and less control over the more quote unquote successful that I get, which is how people take the, window into my life that is my artist persona and what they use it for in their own life and I'm like dude I don't know I can't imagine especially if you're a person who comes out of a scene with a very that's tied up in a lot of principles it's got to be be overwhelming i mean i experience am experiencing like one one thousandth of uh that recognition and it's a lot for me to think about how i'm stewarding a platform and like what i need to say and what i need to do to contribute something meaningful to this world and i think that's a lot to expect of people but and that's like the reason why hmm i don't know small shows i, I don't want to ever be one of those people who's like i don't know kind of stuck in the past or like always wishing for the the good old days <laughs> what have you but i think yeah. you know artists play undersells and small shows and in stores and secret shows 
Maybe because there is an, an intuitive longing to be able to be closer to the people hearing your music, to have it be the communal experience it once was instead of this gulf uh, existing between performer and artist. Um, so, you know, I wonder if a lot of my music is just like trying to understand myself better and performing it is almost like imploring people to under better understand me because human beings long for understanding. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I just think that that give and take is maybe easier to observe or feel in a smaller context, you know? But who knows? Yeah, well, it, it's like the, the, the idea of like, this thing becoming like some sort of doctrine that you carry with you your whole life, you know, sure. like the idea that, you know, we, we all talk about this guilt, you know, that we mm -hmm. have and this idea that like, you know, we want to find a way to absolve ourselves of the guilt of success. And like, I've got friends from other, um, you know, musical backgrounds and they don't carry it in the same way that people that came out of this background carry it. Like, you know, I'm sure there's some that do obviously in, in different people's situations, but I find like, if you don't know who Ian McKay is, you can't have that little Ian McKay sitting on your shoulder. Yep. <laughs> yeah. No, I seriously. And yeah, I wonder too, like if those people feel trapped by the standards that, they espoused like so vehemently in their youth and early in their career that now have had to grow you know what i mean like i can't really think yeah. of one side without the other but it is something very unique to punk and i wouldn't trade it like <laughs> there's so many mechanisms of my life or like experiences i've had that are uh, tied in with guilt like hello christianity but um I wouldn't trade growing up in the punk scene because it, at its core, and I think I had the the extreme privilege of being in a really like posy punk scene <laughs> um, mm -hmm. that was very specific about like friendship and community and mutual aid. I. I wouldn't trade that. I think it, it it informs what is even gratifying to me about music and gives me I don't know, the the relief of knowing it's not something I can own or <laughs> something that is like individual to myself. It's also like it's bigger than any of the participants like, you know, much, you know, like, you know, some people in religion, obviously religious leaders in some cases, like we're failed by our punk leaders constantly. Totally. You know, but yet their work in punk, their texts that they created in punk are more important than them. You know, like we can punk will survive despite the failing of its leaders. It will survive this, despite the fact that we have problematic texts with, that are considered part of the the um the canon yeah. of punk rock you know like i could you know i will interpret bodies as a pro-choice song on never mind the bollocks in spite of the fact that the more you learn about johnny Lydon, it probably wasn't necessarily as progressive as you as i'm hoping to read it as exactly yeah but then it's like and i it's weird because yesterday i had a conversation with this um like folk country-ish artist, this singer-songwriter named Katie Pruitt. She does a, a podcast about, like, reconciling queerness with, like, religious trauma. And w what we talked about was basically the same thing that you're saying right now about how, like, punk becomes dangerous and, or not dangerous, but, like, stratified and exclusionary whenever someone believes that they have the empirical rubric of what makes something punk and what doesn't absolutely the yeah. cool thing about punk is that its definition is constantly evolving through the discourse we have around it 
through what all of the musicians within the scene and who have come from the scene are pouring back into it and that's that makes me happy like i mean and when we talk about like the scene i don't know in it's, it's like when i was growing up in memphis i guess there wasn't I don't know, it wasn't like being in Seattle in the 90s or being in New York in the 80s or being in LA in the whatever. Like, it wasn't this complete renaissance that was associated with a very specific sound or whatever, like hip-hop in Atlanta in the early 2000s or in whatever. Mm. It was so much, like, the scene didn't really have its own personality outside of everyone desperately needing each other in order to make shows happen for whatever your music sounded like um and that's what i don't know i guess when i think of myself as within the scene now it's just that like the scene got bigger and that's fine with me you know, I want more people to have a seat at the table, and I want the scene to be more inclusive. So, <laughs> I I don't really subscribe to the monolith definition of punk or the exclusionary definition of punk. Um, I prefer it to be this like ongoing discourse. <laughs> Well, it, well, that's the thing. It's like you, you, you bring up the fact that it is like an evolving thing, and it is it is something that, like, very much, you know, like when it gets too dogmatic, like look at people bring it up on the show all the time, Los Angeles, and when things started shifting to becoming all hardcore, and you had all this diversity, literally chased out of the scene with yeah. violence. Yeah. Uh, and it's and it's when it becomes, like, when it people become too. I, I don't know fundamentalist about it. That's when you like you start having kids in casualty shirts harassing kids listening to Green Day at the mall. I love it. I love that you remembered that story. That's one of my favorite stories. One of the best stories ever told. Yeah. <laughs> I was just like, why? I like this is the closest thing I have. Well, and also I think it's like often otherness or insecurity breeds a desire to express superiority over someone else yeah and yeah. that's like yeah i don't know i found that with you know i was straight edge for a long time like we we didn't even touch on this and i will probably have to go in a minute but um i like I, yeah whatever i'm sorry no no, no, no it's you, totally like, fine I, it, it's fine <laughs> i could talk to you for so damn long i just i I was supposed to do like I get it. No. errands with my partner <laughs> my and out boring life admins shit. But um, what I was going to say, and I wanted to talk to you about this too, because I, I was straight edge when I spoke to you last. And then I swung over <laughs> into this other, other side of the spectrum in being completely entrenched in substance abuse for like a year but now i don't identify as straight edge at all because of and also i think this has a lot to do with you know last time we talked about southern metalcore and how i think that genre that niche genre sprung up because there were a lot of people being othered for their for whatever reason um or like that wanted to be alt yeah. and have tattoos and gauges and stuff um, that felt like they still wanted to participate in a religious tradition or they they still had questions about what what God is or who God is. And the thing about that though is like uh, it just became for a lot of bands, not all bands went this way like I'm really proud of how Me Without You handled their career and how they speak about God. But there's certainly people who I think become collapsed with their identity as their personhood. And like when your identity is 
being a Christian band, right? Or like being a straight edge band. Um, there's almost like a purity culture, superiority complex that goes along with that. It's like, you know, whatever. I'm an, I'm in a Christian band. I'm trying to save souls mm-hmm. out here at this uh, <laughs> at this uh, beatdown hardcore show. Or like, you know, I, I'm a straight edge person. I'm trying to make music about how I choose not to poison my body with substances and I am purer or clean, cleaner, or clearer minded than other people who let themselves be controlled by alcohol or whatever. And as much as I think it was useful to me, like for a time when I was in college to really dive deep into the history of straight edge culture and use that to prop up the sobriety I was maintaining I also think it can be I mean it is straight up a violent culture like whether or not I experienced that personally or whether or not any of the people I knew that identified as straight edge were like that I cannot deny that in aligning myself with this culture I am also complicit in excusing violence because you know yeah like, oh no definitely that's and, and that's kind of how i feel about the church now it's like yeah i can align myself with the parts of this that are still meaningful to me and that taught me valuable lessons about my life but i absolutely cannot categorize myself nominally with this institution or with this like um cult following subgroup that has actually inflicted a lot of pain and and propagated a lot of violence towards others um yeah like i it's just hearing you talk about the la hardcore scene and the casualties guy makes me think of it's i think a lot of people come to punk because they feel othered and they want to be around people that will accept them but so often that turns into an oppositional resentment and like a counter othering that's not a word yet (laughs) but like um you know what i'm talking about though and i think that's toxic oh definitely right oh definitely like that's the that's the other thing that i think you know uh i hope comes across on this show that like you know, there's a tendency to celebrate things and because of historical distance or whatever, you know, like, like we jokingly talk about Gigi Allen, but like you get down to it, that guy was a monster. Like what he did is inexcusable. Yeah. And like, yet it's kind of like almost humorous now. Like it's like this like punchline um, because it's so shocking. But yeah, at the end yeah. of the day, it's like we can't ever forget the fact that like, fuck, Proud Boys come out of punk rock. Like as much as there's all this amazing shit that comes out of it. There's also this fucking absolutely heinous shit that these people that out of insecurity, whatever, were drawn to it and took it the complete wrong way. And that's the other thing, like, I think that's, you know, makes it like religion in that sense that you have this idea that there will be people that will misinterpret the doctrine at every stage. And and it's almost like the battle for like, what Mm -hmm. is this thing? Yeah, totally. Well, and then I mean, it's like. What are you supposed to do? I, I, I said all this stuff about, you know, I used to be a person who literally, I gave a PowerPoint at a Christian conference that was like the gospel through a punk lens. And it was like all these pictures of youth, youth of today and being like, we should live in community with each other, supporting each other, like all this like posy punk stuff. Um, but dude, what, what do I think like the institution of religion is even you know historically like the purpose it served in civilizations what is it for it's like an accountability system for each other so it's like man i i just wish like i don't know i wish casualties guy had somebody in his life being like you don't have to be insecure about it yeah (laughs) and fortunately i had a whole bunch of people in my life that were older than me that when I would say something judgmental to try to like fit in or to like shit on a band that was bad that would kind of course correct me and be like well 
you know, like, you don't have to be so judgmental. It doesn't make them less. It just means that you don't like their music as much or you don't connect with it like other people do. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm really grateful to be in this conversation with you. Like, honestly, I think it's such important work that you do to make and hold a space for this discourse where we can continue to renegotiate what does this thing even mean? It means something different to virtually everyone you have on the show. And that's the fun of it, you know? Well, I'm grateful that you were here because this has been one of, uh, I don't know, like one of the best conversations I've ever gotten to have for a podcast or not. Um, and anytime oh. you want to come here, like I've kept you for so long and honestly, like everything you say leads me to want to continue this thing. So I'm just going to at the, at respect for the rest of your life, <laughs> say, please come back, Julian, anytime you want. Um, one last thing is hardline. I will. Is, Thank you for having me. Sorry. I, I, I meant, no, I, I'm going to leave it. At no, that. go ahead. No, no, I'm going to leave it at that. No, 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 no. <laughs> ask, ask about hardline. I feel like I know what you're about to ask and I would like to answer it. <laughs> okay. Last time we talked, the last question I asked you, was uh about the x's on boy genius being a reference to straight edge and i was wondering this time is hardline at all a reference to to hardline for sure oh wow yeah that's i mean that song is about i mean just i'll be short but that song is about re-entering a relationship with substance abuse that very quickly became unhealthy and then having to, because I had already started to kind of like question what was the motivation for me being straight edge at this point anymore? Like, was it something about my ego? Was it a superiority complex? Was it actually serving my health? And I wrote that song because I was like, wow, yeah, I spent so much time identifying as this like hardcore, hardline straight edge vegan person and very much categorizing myself in that subculture and then when I was unable to maintain sobriety any longer I felt absolutely crushed and I felt this horrible imposter syndrome and it took me a really long time to kind of reconcile just with that as a part of my identity and it's not supposed to be like a diss song to straight edge culture it's just supposed to be kind of like a dark joke with myself that I identified as straight edge so long and then I ended up writing this song about how weak I felt and how how like how much of a failure I felt like I was when I um was in <laughs> a, a bad way again and ha like I don't know for me it's been a lot about the removal of shame and trying to think of it less as weakness. <laughs> um, but yeah, that is definitely a, a reference to hardline straight edge culture. Okay. Well, I could definitely go a million places from here. So I will just go <laughs> one place, which is thank you again, Julie, for coming on. This yes, <laughs> it is. It has been my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on. It is always so nourishing to talk to you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Julian, for coming on the show or coming back on the show. And Julian will be back for a part three and we'll, we'll go over the record. We were close. We were very close to making the longest turn to punk episode ever. I think we're still beaten by Robbie Brookside part two and Bill Hader part one. But Julian's coming back for that crown. She said it afterwards, you know, anyway. Thank you, Julian. That was incredible. Thank you for the conversation. And also incredible is Little Oblivions, available now on Matador Records everywhere. Everywhere you get records. Every single place you get records, you will find this record. I hope. It should be that way. It should be. Speaking of should, you should definitely come back to this show later on over this weekend. Because coming up on this show, we have a legend, a legend... From the band Face to Face, Trevor Keith is here, and he talks about his kind of unusual journey getting into punk rock. It's a, it's a really fun conversation. I'm very, very excited for you to hear it, and that is coming up in a kind of a few short days for the show. Anyway, that is it. 
Remember, as always, black lives matter. The lives of indigenous people matter. We need to protect trans kids and we need to help trans people protect themselves. And there, there needs to be a stop of violence towards Asian people. Get involved, get informed, go out there, read, volunteer. There's just so much shit going on. There's, there's really no end to where, uh, your, your, your mind and your, your effort should go right now because, uh, yeah, it, it gets it gets a little bleak sometimes, but you know we all got to get together and just smash fascism. Just stand up and and stand up for people, because these aren't political issues. These are just like human rights issues. You know, everyone everyone deserves the right to just live in peace, and that's really what we're trying to do here. Go out and do something creative, make something. You know, you don't have to do something to show the rest of the world, but just do something for yourself. Create your own culture. Do whatever it takes. Make a fanzine, start a podcast, start a band. Just draw a picture. You just, just draw a picture for yourself. Just, you know, try it. Try it. Try meditating. You know, I've been trying it. I've been talking about it. It still works for me. Maybe it will work for you. Who knows? Um, you know, who knows? Sign your organ donor cards because by the time they come looking for those organs, you don't need them. You don't need them. And uh, wear a mask, stay distance, and stay safe. And we'll get through it. We'll get through it. All right. See you on the next episode. Thanks for listening. And don't forget to check out Oil and Flowers with Buddha Blaze and myself. Big 420 party coming up. And check it out. Check out, check out more details on Oil and Flowers. I think that's it. Bye.